The propaganda and newspaper screamings attached to the Walters Lunar Expedition, the first determined effort by 30 men to reach the moon, had no sooner taken on a forlorn note and the rocket ship been given up for lost when a new and sensational happening was splashed across the front pages. I'm a stratosphere pilot on the New York Polar City route. My name's Jerry Dodd, my age 32. I was one of the first to see the announcement. So much for that. Now to that evening edition, which a lot of you have seen. Banner headlines proclaimed, Vampires attack London. Vampires? Great Scott! Throwbacks to the old days of superstition and half-baked occultism. Certainly not in tune with the keen progressive spirit of 1960 science. Yet here I was. Outside Stratosphere headquarters, I read the columns quickly with growing surprise. Then they had made off, and there followed an assortment of speculations regarding the possibility of the birds having come from some part of Earth still unexplored. This seemed to me to be most unlikely, since Earth is charted and mapped from pole to equator, and civilizations sprawl right across the planet. Finally, I came to the conclusion that somebody must have been having delusions and went off to my favorite automat for coffee. I had hardly got started, however, before something close to panic swept the street outside. The orderly procession of people in the summer evening light suddenly started dashing for shelter. At the same time, there burst on my startled senses the sound of screaming brakes, the hoarse cries of men and women. Then an avalanche of people came running in through the doorway with horror stamped on their faces. I caught at a young fellow as he came dashing past me and forced him to halt. What the hell's wrong out there, I demanded of him. He was gulping so hard for breath I could hardly tell what he said. Vampires, huge things, birds, killing folks. Releasing him, I fought my way through the people to the door and somehow got out into the street. It was a staggering sight which met me. The sun had set now, but against the orange flush between the rearing piles of buildings, were some 30 enormous birds with a wing spread of perhaps 250 feet. They looked like bats and dived with terrifying velocity, wings folded, filling the air with a leathery, beating rustle that somehow had a paralyzing effect on the nerves. In places they had come down to the street, even as I watched, I saw men and women lifted helplessly into the air to be dropped back with violent force. It was the most ghastly attack I had ever witnessed. I hurried to the nearest fallen man and caught at him. He was pretty nearly dead, and in the back of his neck were two deep punctures about an inch across. He moved feebly in my grasp. Then, before he could utter a word, death caught up with him, and he relaxed. But I had had the time to notice that it was rather the shock he had received than actual injury which had killed him. His neck was not broken, nor had he lost over much blood. In fact, his only trouble seemed to be a broken ankle from the fall. Then one of the things died for me. I had my service ray gun in my belt, and I fired instantly. The vicious ray lashed the monster across the belly as it swept over to within a few feet of me. To my horrified amazement, the ray glanced off. Either the creature was armor-plated, or else of a constitution impervious to earthly destructive devices. I took the only way out to save myself, dashed for a doorway. This saved me, for the thing whizzed past once or twice with a dank, moldering odor, and then flew off to join its fellows. The confusion increased. Corps of militia arrived with their defensive weapons and set about the flying monsters in real earnest. I joined them, since of course I am experienced in campaigning as well as being a civil pilot. Our efforts, though none too effective, at least harassed the things badly, with the result that they finally flew off. But not until every window around us had been broken, and scores of men and women lay dead or dying in the streets. Night had fallen now, too, and the scene looked doubly horrible in the pallid glare of arc lights. I straightened up at last, sweating and breathless, watched the final monster hurtle upwards and vanish. The attack was over. For God's sake, what are they? panted a gunner beside me. I shook my head. No idea. But I'll find out soon enough. I'm going to headquarters to see what they think. I made my way through the arriving fleet of ambulances, and so back to Stratosphere headquarters. Within I found an air of tense activity. Fellow pilots were hurrying about everywhere, most of them in their rarely worn battle kit, their faces grim. I went through the midst of them into the briefing room. 
What's going on? I asked the controlling officer as he studied a list of notes anxiously. Plenty, he snapped back. Those damn birds came from London. It seems they didn't return to London after flying around but crossed the Atlantic to have a go at us. God knows where they originated, some remote part of Earth, I suppose. Things like that don't belong to Earth, I told him grimly. Unless I'm dead wrong, they've come from another world. He shrugged. Well, we're taking no chances. A squadron of Stratus fighters has taken off in ten minutes to search for them. They can stand ray gun charges, but I think the protonic guns will put paid to them quick enough. So far, they seem to have limited themselves to attack. No kidnapping. And there won't be either if we can stop it. That means I go up too, I questioned eagerly. But to my disappointment, he shook his head. Not yet. You're too valuable on the civil line. You'll stand by for orders. Report back here in an hour. I had to take it, of course, but it was hard to see the others ready for action and departing from me with good luck smiles. Finally, I wandered out of the building, then, struck with a sudden thought, I headed uptown. Might as well reassure myself that Eva was safe anyway. The moment I reached her apartment block, though, I saw that something was wrong. Not a window in the place had survived the onslaught of an hour before. I quickened from my leisurely pace and raced up the staircase to her apartment, rapped on the door. Eva, open up! It's me, Jerry! There was no reply from within, yet I knew Eva Grant must be at home for her evenings were spent in studying for the advanced science examination she was determined to pass before we were married. Again, I hammered. Then, as I got no answer, I hurtled myself against the door and sent it flying backward on its hinges. There lay Eva in the floor of the living room, shattered glass from the window all around her, blood smearing the back of her neck under her thick, dark hair. Hauling her up in my arms, I carried her to a chair. She was alive, thank God, though her pulse was feeble. Bandages and restorative brought consciousness slowly back to her. Color began to creep back into her cheeks. Weakly, she turned her head, then winced at the pain in her neck. She looked at me and smiled faintly. Hello, Jerry. You were attacked by one of those damned bird things, I demanded. And as she nodded, I hurried down in the next room and snatched down a blood test syringe, a small everyday device used by most of us for determining physical condition. She started as the needle stabbed her arm. Then I gave a low sigh of relief as my worst fears were banished. Her blood was normal enough, no sign of venom from the thing's jaws. Just what happened, I asked her as she began to recover. I... I hardly remember. I heard the commotion outside, so I went to the window to take a look. Then one of the birds came shooting down, smashed the window glass in pieces. I dodged the splinters, thank goodness, but it didn't avail me much. The bird came half into the room, got me by the back of the neck. Well, next thing I remember, I saw you. I clenched my fist. If only I knew what these birds are, what they're after. I don't think they're of this world anyway, she said, her voice quiet. I've studied enough science to know that. I saw the bird at close quarters, and it was covered in a black, non-light reflecting substance, utterly invulnerable. Nature doesn't provide her creatures with a covering like that without a very good reason. And the only reason I can think of is protection against the cold of space. Just as a fish has extra bones to withstand the pressure of water. I guessed myself that they don't belong to her, if I said. Then I snapped my fingers. What about the moon? I wondered about that, she said, musing. Their size is feasible then, since the moon's gravity is only a sixth of the Earth's. But why they should so suddenly come to Earth like this, I can't imagine. Unless, she finished slowly, the Walter's lunar expedition to the moon did succeed after all, and furious at the invasion of their domain, these creatures are trying to exact reprisal. Remember, Jerry, there are 30 birds from all accounts, and 30 men went to Luna. Sort of ties up, doesn't it? It was as good an idea as any, but it didn't make things any easier. I debated for a moment, but before I could say anything further, there came to our ears through the smashed windows that already grimly familiar sound of leathery beating and the whistle of cleaved air. They're coming back! Evo gasped hoarsely, leaping up from her chair, and at the same moment there came a miscellany of screams and shouts from the streets below. But I was not concerned with this. My gaze was directed to the window as bird after bird came hurtling from the heights. As though driven by some inexplicable instinct, one of them dived and twisted abruptly, hurtling straight for the shattered window. It came with such demoniac force, it knocked me flying. 
but at least I have the time to see it. It certainly resembled the old-time pterodactyl. There was the same evil head, the merciless scar of beak, the beady, heavily filmed eyes as though for extra strong protection. The wing spread, huge though it was, was handled with easy grace. So much I had time to note, then I was struggling with the thing for all I was worth. Firing my useless gun at it, I strove to prevent it settling on the fighting, screaming Eva, but again that steel-hard casing it possessed defeated all my efforts. Right before my eyes, Eva was lifted in the thing's jaws and borne swiftly toward the window. I made one last desperate effort to save her, but a beating wing struck me with such force I went spinning six feet away and crashed half senseless against the wall. By the time I had recovered my balance and wits, Eva had gone nor could I see any sign of her by the time I rushed to the window. In the street below, there was pandemonium, as several of the men and women not yet removed from the earlier attack were picked up and carried aloft like children seized by giant eagles. In all, there were probably 30 of the monsters once again, and they gathered together almost like plane squadrons, carrying a man or woman each and heading for the night sky. By the time I had blundered distractedly downstairs to the street, there were few of them left. The defense guns were rattling again, just as futilely as before. I didn't even stop to watch them. At top speed, I raced to Stratosphere Headquarters and hurried in to the controlling officer. I've got to go up and help settle those damned things, I told him. They stole my fiance not two minutes ago, and hop to it, he ordered briefly. We want every man we can get right now. We were going to send for you anyway. Squadron K, Action Station 9. I nodded and raced out. Within 10 minutes, desperation had hurled me into the air with all engines going the limit. I felt that there might be a chance even yet to overtake the flying horrors, since I reckoned that their speed would slow down as they reached the stratosphere, loaded as they were too. In this, I was partly right. As I climbed, I saw a group of them against the full moonlight. By this time, New York was a mere segment of spotted light infinitely far below me. Instantly, I broke from my squadron and went streaking across the sky after them. They saw me, headed for the greater heights. I was after them immediately, climbing, climbing, with the motors thundering a steady, effortless song. But one thing puzzled me now. These birds no longer carried human beings in their jaws. Two horrible thoughts flashed upon me. Had they dropped their captives? Or was this another flock of birds entirely? Well, what did it matter now? Attack them anyway, and trust to the rest of the boys to get whatever others there might be. The moment I got near enough, I opened up with my protonic guns. They shied. One actually blew to pieces, and that brought a hard grin of satisfaction to my face. At last, I had a weapon they couldn't stand. Sheer energy biting into their filthy bodies was more than they could tolerate, evidently. The fate of this one, however, warned the others. To my amazement, they suddenly folded their wings into their bodies and rose higher and higher with increasing swiftness. How they did it, I could not imagine. And it was tragic, too, from my own point of view. There were definite limits to which my plane could ascend, and to go much higher would mean going beyond the atmosphere altogether. Then, apparently annoyed by my pursuit, one of them deliberately stalled and waited poised uncannily in space. I could not slow myself down in time, with the result that I hurtled straight at it. Instinctively, I dove out of my chair, and it was this which saved me, for the creature came smashing through the observation dome amid a shower of splinters. Instantly, the frightful cold of these great heights surged into my cabin. I would certainly have died, but for the protection of my strato mask and kit. I half knelt by the wall, clawing at the driving, battering mass of shell-encrusted leather overwhelming me. It mastered me in a few seconds, whirled me about, then tore the helmet from its studs at the back of my neck. Savage pain went through the length of my body. Then, I must have fainted. I returned to consciousness, aware of the most inexplicable sensation. Beyond having a stiff neck, I was sublimely comfortable. I seemed to be lying in the midst of a feather bed, and every weight and pressure of normal existence had gone from me. I had air, warmth, and ease beyond all parallel. From those last conscious moments of horror to this, paradise demanded a good deal of puzzled thinking. When I had sorted things out, I got the shock of my life. I was lying in a kind of pouch, softly hairlined and composed of rubber-like skin. One section of this skin was slightly transparent, 
and through it I gazed upon the incredible vision of space itself, something I had never seen before. Stars by the quadrillion, a sun girdled with prominences, a moon at the full and already swollen beyond normal dimensions, growing so fast I could see the shadows of the slight right-hand edge of the approaching wane. As I took this in, incredulously enough, my eyes moved on to a flock of birds, wings tight-pressed to their sides, speeding in straight-line formation through the gulf. I counted thirty-eight of them altogether. On the nearer ones I beheld a bulging pouch after the fashion of a kangaroo. Now I understood. Their jaws had been emptied because the captives had gone into the pouches. I was inside the thing that had attacked me then, being carried without harm. From vague revulsion, my emotion changed to wonder at this marvel of nature defeating the void of space, yet keeping me safe. Air, I discovered, was entering from a natural sac at one end of the pouch and being expelled by the action of a steadily working muscle and natural vent at the other. Surely nature, in all her varied moods, had never created so outlandish a creature as this. But the reason for it all! I fingered my neck. Blood had dried there. Why hadn't I been killed? Then it became obvious to me, as the moon increased in size, that there was our destination. And at a gigantic speed, too. The more I studied the birds, the more I could see a faint stream of energy being projected from their tails. I think I guessed right in assuming that they utilized the radiations of space as an ordinary bird utilizes air pushing against its different densities and cleaving through it, given just the right energy wavelength by nature to expel against it and hurtle them forward. Obviously, they could live either in air or out of it. The air I was receiving had evidently been stored somewhere and was now being released for my especial benefit. And at the end of the journey, that was a grim thought. The more I pondered, the more sure I felt that this was an act of vengeance for the desecration of their domain by the Walters Lunar Expedition. If so, then I was resolved to sell my life as dearly as possible. I still had my ray gun anyway. Rather than fall victim to a lot of educated pterodactyls, I'd turn it on myself. At intervals I slept in curiously drowsy contentment, an effect undoubtedly engendered by my cozy position and lack of restricting gravity. I believe the birds absorbed nourishment from the void somehow probably using the very medium against which they thrust, or else they absorbed radiations unimaginable to the flesh and blood Earthman. And each time I awoke, the moon was larger and had waned further, until finally we were dropping in perfect formation down to its powdery, blinding white surface. Craters, glaring mountain ranges, dead sea bottoms, all reared up towards us at alarming speed. Trained as I was to maneuvering a plane, it seemed to me that a crash was inevitable, but at the last second, with easy grace, the whole flock swept over the nearest mountains and dove down into the depths of an extinct crater. The sunlight snuffed out as though it had never been. We were plunging through abysmal airless shadows into the very depths of the moon. The darkness was so intense after the glare outside, I was almost blinded. Then, after a while, it began to lighten. From somewhere below, a deep pinkish light swelled into a rosy glow. It lighted towering canyons, the pumice-like escarpments of this honeycombed satellite, until finally we broke free and landed in a vast central area which I judge must be the approximate core of the moon. And here, unsupported as far as I could tell, blazed the circular red ball, illuminating the colossal cavern from end to end. Judging from the soft shadows, there was air here, of sorts. Something pushed me, muscles, I think, and I was ejected from the bird's pouch like a pea popped from a pod. I got to my feet, balancing with some difficulty against the lesser gravitation. Obviously, we were not exactly at the moon's core, else the gravity would have been equal on all sides, and I'd have been in mid-air. That blazing ball, as far as I could judge, was some sort of radioactive material possibly even one of the last natural energy minerals left in the moon. But how it hung there without support, I just couldn't imagine. Then, as I got over the eye-wrenching dimensions of the cavern and drew comparatively fresh air into my lungs, I looked anxiously round on my fellow travelers. They, too, had been ejected, thirty of them. And among them, pale but unharmed, was Eva. I rushed over to her right away and caught her arm. Eva, thank God you're safe! 
Looks as if the guess about the Selenites was right, she commented after a moment looking round. But what the idea is, I'll be hanged if I know. Evidently, we were soon to find out, for waddling forward in penguin style on their queer feet, the birds forced us by no means roughly to advance along the cavern floor. They did it by prodding us with their beaks, and when we showed reluctance, they merely pushed the harder, without resorting to the terrible force they could have used had they wished. This at last seemed a hopeful sign, but back of my mind was the remembrance of the carnage and destruction they had caused back on Earth. Probably we were being led to the slaughter. We advanced perhaps a mile, and in that time, the red ball seemingly so near at hand came no closer to us. I was puzzling over it when Eva seemed to solve the problem. It must actually be enormously big and a long distance away, situated at the exact central core of the moon. Therefore, it needs no support because gravity is pulling equally on all sides. It's probably the final unburned out core and forms a sun of this inner world. I suppose that's the explanation. We stopped suddenly on the edge of a long sloping incline. Down at the base of it, 300 feet perhaps, was the real floor of the moon's core. More than that, there was a city of sorts. It looked utterly crazy from Earth standards because it was composed of walls without roofs. There wasn't a roof anywhere, but there was a definite impression of order, and everything was built to an obvious plan. Why, it's a, a nest city. Eva ejaculated, gazing down. The Selenites must enter their homes through the roof, just as an earth bird gets into its nest. I nodded as we gazed in wonder. The rest of the people gathered, doubting and anxious about us. Then I directed my attention to something standing apart from the mass of square roofless buildings. It was a tapering obelisk with a kind of platform at the top. Upon this, fastened down with massive cables, was a sadly battered and travel-stained rocket ship. The Walters Expedition Machine, I cried, pointing to it. And no sign of the 30 men who went in it, Eva said with ominous quietness. And there are 30 of us here too. It begins to look pretty bad. She couldn't get any further, for the Selenites pushed us forward again. We were forced to hurry down the sloping cavern side, with them behind us, and the nearer we came to the roofless houses, the more we could see how large they really were. We were driven past more of them, but here and there we did catch glimpses that showed these weird creatures were anything but limited to a bird's intelligence. There were many baffling machines in some of the buildings, queerly fashioned for ornithic instead of human appendages. And so, finally, we were seized and lifted over the high wall of one of the largest buildings of all, set gently on our feet. Here I felt horror grip me completely. The place was pretty well crowded with birdmen of varying sizes. Some were quite small and less like birds than those which had brought us hither. Nor had they any sacks, so presumably they were of a different species. More, they had rudimentary forearms supplied with a human-like hand. Most of them seemed to be busy with a variety of instruments. But it was not this that horrified me. It was the sight of thirty Earthmen, motionless and deathly white, strapped to thirty immaculately clean tables. Every member of the Walters Lunar Expedition was there, from Commander Walters himself to the lowliest rocket hand, strapped down at the center of these abominable things of a near-dead world. What? What are they going to do? Eva whispered, her startled eyes turning to me. I glanced about me at the drawn faces of the others, then at the impregnable lofty walls. Certainly there was no retreat, but there were no doors. The only chance of escape, and that none too certain, lay in getting over the towering walls around us. But on this I had little time to speculate, for Eva's horrified gasp snapped me back to studying the scene confronting us. Others of the Selenite scientists had come into the long operating theater now, pushing rubber-wheeled stretchers before them. And there were thirty of them. Straps were dangling from them in readiness for... Nothing could have been more significant. They were meant for us. We all shifted uneasily, but we couldn't move far, for the waiting flying selenites were immediately back of us, prodded us with their beaks if we moved too far. So we were forced to watch the ghastly business. To each pinioned expedition man's table, there was run alongside a vacant, trestled stretcher. Between stretcher and table was placed a machine which bristled cables and pumps, 
It looked rather like one of those old-time ticker tape machines. Once this was done, in all 30 cases, the chief operating surgeon made a signal. One of our party, a man, was seized and forced across the floor, fighting and screaming at the top of his strength. Ultimately, as the rest of us watched in quaking anticipation, he was forced down on the furthest stretcher and strapped into place. Delicate needles in the claw hands of one of the surgeons began to probe the back of his neck as he yelled and screamed. This was getting too much. My rising fear began to spill over when one after another of our party was seized and similarly treated. Any moment now it would be the turn of Eva and then me. But not if I could help it. I ran my eyes quickly along the wall surrounding us. We had only a sixth of Earth's gravity to defeat. If we could get away in one flying leap, we might... Then what? No spaceship. Yes, there was one. The one on the pedestal. If only we could get to it, we could perhaps... I confided my notions to Eva in whispers as she watched the slowly dwindling line of victims. Finally, she nodded and waited for my signal. I gave it when the penultimate one to her was taken and bundled over to a stretcher. Now, I shouted, and then ran and leapt with all my power. The surprise of my move helped. I never put such strength into a leap before. Up I went, sailing high over the heads of the astonished bird surgeons, until I landed on the broad top of the wall. Not a second behind me came Eva. She would have overshot the mark, being lighter than I, had I not clutched her. With hardly a moment's pause, we leapt downwards to the street outside, then proceeded in gargantuan jumps towards that distant obelisk with the space machine atop it. But we'd reckoned without the demoniac speed of those lunar birds. Inside a minute, they were sweeping after us with projectile velocity. We leapt round the back of a building for protection, and I snatched out my ray gun, determined, if we must be captured, to give a good account of myself first. So covering Eva as best I could, I stood there blazing away as rapidly as I could press the button. One of the creatures I did damage, for I shot it through one vulnerable spot, the eye. It crashed to the street, twisting and squirming, but this did not deter the others. Again and again my ray glanced off their armor-plated bodies, until at last my gun was empty of charges, and I had to throw it away. In any case, the game was up now. Struggling savagely, we were seized in those mighty jaws, lifted in the air, and borne back swiftly to the operating theater. Again it came to me with passing wonder that the creatures didn't kill us there and then. Had they chosen to close their jaws, they could easily have cut us in half. But they didn't. Instead, they finally deposited us on the two remaining stretchers, held us down by main strength while the straps were buckled into place. I gave up struggling because I had to. I simply lay, breathing hard, my head turned sideways to watch Eva. She was looking terrified, and no wonder. The rest of our party was motionless now, as dead-faced and immobile as the members of the Walters expedition beside whom they lay. Finally, I glared up at the bird-faced surgeon, studying the ticker tape machine beside me. Look here, you! What's the meaning of all this? I demanded. What's the explanation? We're entitled to that, aren't we? Not a vestige of expression showed on his weird face. I doubted if he even heard me, and certainly there were no attempts at thought transference. He simply went on calmly with his task, which consisted of fixing a sort of cradle so that my head was forced forward slightly. It was in no wise uncomfortable, but I was desperately afraid just the same. Then I felt something stab my neck. Almost immediately my body seemed to float away from me, and I lost consciousness of my surroundings. I do not know how long I was senseless, but to my surprise I found myself in a quite earthly looking bed. The implacable bird-like scientist who had gone to work on me was there too, and in the next bed was Commander Walters himself, the man next to whom I had been lying when I had lost consciousness. He was sitting up, even smiling slightly. I looked beyond him, down an immense ward. Everybody was conscious again, talking to each other, tended by selenites. Far away, I could see Eva, apparently none the worse. I turned my eyes back to Walter's bronzed, amused face. What the devil's the idea of all this? I exploded. Then, before he could answer me, I went on hurriedly. Look, we've got to think of a way of getting back to Earth. Some hellish sort of experiment is going on. These blood-sucking vultures. Nothing of the sort, man. Walter's contradicted me abruptly. They're gallant scientists, all of them. 
The pterodactyl type are probably the bravest warriors of the race. They took an awful chance going to Earth as they did. Their methods must have looked like deliberate attack, I suppose, but that was not true. How many Earthlings died? He asked me. Dozens, I imagine, but it was an attack. No, he insisted. It was necessity. Those who died must have succumbed to shock, nothing more. The flying selenites fitted by nature for spaceflight are natural chemical agents. Their task was to find people whose blood quota exactly matched that of we 30 men here, of the expedition. I stared at him blankly. You mean, I whispered, that when they were making their vampirish attacks, plugging people in the neck, they were actually making blood tests? Exactly. Didn't you see for yourself how marvelously their internal organs are constructed? They are living laboratories and able to carry anything in a special pouch. I remembered this part, and it was just commencing to dawn on me why none of us had been really hurt. So, Walters resumed, when they had checked their results, they knew the exact 30 people they wanted, and the instinct of a bird, a power we do not possess since it is sixth sense, led them straight to the 30 they wanted when they decided to carry them back to the moon. But what in hell for? I cried. To save our lives, he answered solemnly. All 30 of us got to the moon here, but we were badly smashed up in the doing, and we lost a good deal of blood. The Selenites, being differently constructed than we are, couldn't supply the necessary life fluid, so they did the only thing possible and dispatched agents to Earth to find blood donors. Believe me, it has been worth it, he finished. The moon, as you've seen for yourself, is not dead, and its race is very friendly towards us. We can give them much. They can give us much. The invasion of Earth was a necessary evil, but out of it will come untold benefits. You should feel proud, you and your friends, that you were chosen. You've become a bridge between worlds and have laid the foundations of an interplanetary union. I nodded, slowly, gradually realizing the enormity of the thing that had been done. I caught Eva's eyes in the distance and knew that she realized the truth too. Then I look up, as I saw a claw-like hand extended towards me. Something like a smile was on the face of the Selenite surgeon. I've actually been sitting on this video for close to a year now, so it's good to have it finally uh, finally in the schedule. I like having things done in advance when possible, but uh, this, is, this is a new level of that for me. I want to say thank you to all of my amazing Patreon supporters, particularly Michael Fittori, Zanazira, and Break System BSE. And we've got some new uh, exciting series coming to the channel very soon of varying degrees of quality and sanity. So... Stay tuned for that, and in the meantime, thanks for being you.